Okay. Thanks, Marek. Thanks for uh, giving us some time on, on, your, on your agenda. Uh, indeed, uh, what you're seeing in the picture is a uh, super MOOC. Uh, uh, what you see on the picture basically is three generations of super MOOC. Uh, on the left side, it's the next generation super MOOC. On the right side, is the previous generation. And in the back, it is the, the first generation of super, super MOOC. All three generations of warm water cool. And uh, in the middle, you see the installation for dispersion chilling, so creating cold water from warm water to get the data center even more efficient. So what I wanted to cover uh, today is, is uh, something that most uh, HPC data centers and, and centers are going to run into or, or, or have run into already. And that is um, the uh, problematic startup and problem, problematic management of, of uh, AI development uh, when coming from an HPC uh, data center. So, the topic of today is managing the convergence of HPC um, and uh, AI. So let me kickstart with with a short overview of what's happening in in, in the marketplace at the moment. Um, from a from a uh, an, an AI perspective, what we see is a tremendous amount of development. Uh, funding is 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 huge. There has been uh, almost twelve billion dollars of equity funding to uh, get uh, 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 over 100 AI startups up and running and get the solutions into the market and uh, finance their uh, development. Computing technologies are developing very rapidly at the moment. And, and certainly if we're looking at the coming two years, there's going to be a couple of performance speed up uh, both on CPU and on the, on the, on the GPU level. Uh, open source is one of the areas that is very much appreciated by many. Uh, on the other side, I will make clear also that uh, it is a potential area of disruption also in the development of, of AI solutions and machine learning uh, solutions. Uh, crucial for uh, AI and machine learning de development is, is good business cases and data supporting those business cases. So. Growth of the of the data is already being being experienced, um, and and if we're looking according to IDC by 2025, it's going to be 10 times the amount of data that we have now, uh, adding up to uh, 163 zettabytes. I I don't even dare to uh, define what a zettabyte is, but I think one zettabyte is a trillion gigabytes. So 160 trillion gigabytes of data by 2025 per year. Uh, and data that potentially can be used uh, by machine learning and artificial intelligence to, to optimize uh, mainly business, but also research uh, exercise. So if we uh, go to the, uh, to the next uh, page now, uh, what, what, there's a, where, where do we see the convergence happening? The convergence is happening on, on a number of areas. Convergence is happening on the uh, uh, segments uh, where applications are being developed. Uh, applications are being developed and have to be uh, deployed um, uh, to um, uh, to improve the level of work that we're doing, uh, with, which requires the AI. I will give you a couple of examples uh, in a minute on, on the next slide. So on an application level, a lot is happening. Uh, on a technology level, a lot is happening on the level of, of technology from a hardware perspective, uh, applications with frameworks, um, adoption of new hardware capabilities within processors and accelerators, uh, improvements of high, uh, uh, high bandwidth, low latency networks, also driving uh, the improvement of, of the deployment capabilities of AI and machine learning capabilities dramatically. Locality is another area where convergence is happening. Uh, if you have a uh, if you have typical HPC infrastructures, um, they typically are centralized, and of course through grid capabilities that can be uh, uh, they can be uh, spread uh, over a geographically dis dispersed uh, environment, but typically it is it is centra centralized. So what we see now is is that those areas are will be and have to be. Uh, opened up and enabled also to support 
artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, workload. I will speed up the process a little bit. So one of the one of the programs that Lenovo is executing on very rapidly and very intensely from an AI and machine learning perspective is um, uh, solving humanity's greatest challenges. So that's where we uh, deploy and want to deploy our technology and support in in uh, typically research institutions, but also commercial deployments that want to. Uh, that have a, have a goal of improving what we're doing. If you're looking at North, North Carolina State University, for instance, one of the things that we're doing over there together with North Carolina State is analyzing uh, images, uh, images, uh, satellite images to, uh, to optimize uh, the dispersion of, of water uh, to make sure that the food supply gets the water it needs instead of getting too much water or getting too less, uh, not enough water. Uh, University College London, uh, UCL, uh, what they're doing is, is with optical capabilities, they're analyzing uh, the rays in the, the particle collisions in the uh, uh, Large Hadron Collider. Um, another one is, is a commercial one, Vestas. You all know Vestas as a, as a commercial windmill manufacturer. Vestas started buying commercial data in the marketplace on seismic level on climate uh, uh, level on, on local weather information and they de they decided to to purchase that and consolidate it, consolidate that in a big data warehouse that data warehouse infrastructure is now used through uh, for for different purposes it's being used for the purpose of helping them um, create define and build the their windmills so so it's used to determine what the foundation of a windmill has to be before they erect it, to make sure that the foundation is solid enough. Uh, and you know, imagine that you're erecting a windmill somewhere on a fjord in Norway. If you're off 50 meters, then it's going to be a very expensive exercise. So from a business perspective, that's what has been driving Vestas, for instance, to uh, start with, with commercial data and, and now optimizely, optimize the use of of, of, of their data uh, and, and that data is being used by their salespeople selling those those windmills to those that have the space to erect a windmill. Uh, so their salespeople within minutes can explain to someone who's interested in a windmill what the efficiency of a windmill is going to be based on all the data that they have been aggregated and that they are using uh, AI uh, algorithms uh, uh, on to determine what the most efficient deployment is going to be. Um, so, so if we're looking at at the business of of AI, there is a big transformation happening, a big transformation happening in the way how we how compute data, uh, compute resources, and data resources. Uh, can be used, will be used, and have to be used. And the main bottleneck, and according to uh, 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 an article written by uh, in, in by Eric Eric and Andrew in the Business of Artificial Intelligence uh, uh, ma magazine, the bottleneck now is management implementation and business imagination. And with business imagination, that's the area where also the uh, the data scientists are going to play a role. Because one of the things that we see that um, commercial companies are struggling with, they are sitting on the data, but they don't know how to translate the data that they have into something that brings value to them. So if we're looking at the different um, segments of AI capabilities and end user values, then what I've tried to list in the middle over here is what you see of core capabilities from, from an AI perspective. So you have computer vision, you have national language processing as a, as a segment, you have predictive analytics as a segment, and knowledge graphs. So on the left side, you see what consumers, what, what that translates to for consumers. So facial recognition, uh, smart speakers, uh, everybody, or most people I know nowadays, have uh, something that is uh, that is called Siri, or that is called Google, or that is called Amazon, uh, which they're using to uh, as a as a personal assistant. 
But that is a that is an implementation of national language processor by speaking to a device, having that assistant helping you uh, facilitate things like playing music in the background while you are listening or while you're doing your work or um, getting signals in when your security camera outside site determines something that that shouldn't be there. From a technical, from an enterprise perspective, one of the things I mentioned already is what, what Vestas, for instance, is doing. They're using that data to design the windmill. They determine how tall it should be, what the vein should be looking like, and, they, they, and it, they're feeding it into their CFD applications to make sure that the material they use and the structural and mechanics of, 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 the, of, of the veins, for instance, uh, based on the weather prediction, based on the wind force prediction, is strong enough and efficient enough to uh, create that efficiency that uh, that they have sold to their to their end users and to the to their customers. So, from an enterprise thinking, how how enterprises think of AI? Well, you know, you have use cases. We mentioned I mentioned the use cases already, like virtual agents, or call agents that that. Uh, nowadays sound pretty human when you call them, but still, you know, when you ask uh, some questions, then you rapidly find out that you're still talking to a machine instead of to an, to, to an agent of, a, of, a, of an insurance company, for instance. Um, so the use cases, the basic use cases are there. And, you know, from, from a business perspective, it very often is said by C-level ex executives, you know, we need a AI. Because they read in magazines that if they if they not engage on AI, they're being left they're left behind. So the next step on that process is you know, let's hire data scientists. You know, if you can find a good data scientist that's not being hired by Google, Apple, or Microsoft already, uh, then uh, you know uh, cherish them um, because they start to become uh, very difficult to get, very hard, very hard to get. On the right side, you see. The the, uh, the data sources in the top of the vertical, the big data consolidation, AI development, and then based on the AI development, the AI-enabled applications. So if you look at this, it's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. But on the other hand, is it really? No. It's not that easy. It's not that straightforward. It's a pretty complex exercise to translate your business requirements into something that's usable and workable. So if you look at the basic approach of um, and the flow that you will be going to from, from an idea, from a solution definition, from awareness within, a, within an enterprise or within a research institution to demo capabilities, proof of concept capabilities, you have to go through a number of phases. The phases are from the left to the right on the screen. So you find the solution, you define the solution, you are you, you start collecting your data that could be extracting the data from existing data rep repositories uh, as also the next step emphasizes which is data cleansing data cleansing enriching formatting labeling to make sure that you can use it in the optimum way and to make sure that it's being used by your algorithms in the way that you want it to be used so modeling and development management that's more related to how do you translate that data and the applications onto the infrastructure. Tuning and retraining is the next phase in the life cycle. And that's a repetitive cycle of, of the process. And then application development and deployment. So it is a, a pretty complex uh, flow that you have to go through. And from an infrastructure human resource perspective and a data, uh, data uh, and device perspective, there's different segments of... Uh, of capabilities that you need and different segments of resources that you need. You, be, you start with a consultants, then you start with people that have a lot of experience with how to clean up data and how to enrich data. Then the data scientist kicks in. And remember in the previous slide, I said, you know, they typically start hiring a data science, scientist. Well, that's not the only specialist that you need. In, in the life cycle of, a, of an AI algorithm to develop an AI algorithm. So if we now look at knowing this, how can we move forward? You know, new clusters are getting there. New clusters will be used or, or existing clusters will be used in a, in a different way. 
what that means, um, I will leave this for you to read also in the presentation where you, where you download it and read it. I will go to the next segment. You know, it's a different world. So on the left side, you see an AI user. On the right side, you see an HPC uh, specialist. So I try to simplify what the difference is between this world. So the new AI user knows that he has to do something and, he, and that he needs compute resources because he has developed an algorithm on his laptop and now wants to be able to test the scale up of those algorithms. So he determines that he needs a supercomputer. First question is, of course, sure. What applications are, are you going to run? Uh, the answer is AI. Do you know how to use a scheduler? For HPC people, a scheduler is something that they use on a daily basis. What is a scheduler? It's the first question you get back when you talk to someone who's been analyzing data and working on data uh, as, as, a, as a core business to determine what he can do with it from an al with algorithms and from a business perspective. Okay, so okay, I think we, we have to help you submit jobs. So that's where the HPC people need to support the AI specialists already. So then the question is, what are the workload characteristics? Characteristic, what are workload? Characteristics. Mm, okay. So at the end of the line, you find out that there is no common ground yet between AI and HPC. Uh, so what we did is we tried to simplify that and optimize that, uh, uh, which is what I will be showing in one or two slides. So from my data science exper exper experimentation, it starts small on the laptop, then it goes to a workstation to bigger workstation, perhaps to a number of workstations, Ethernet together. So where to go net, next? Cluster. And uh, we see distributed training uh, uh, kicking up very rapidly, taking up very rapidly. Lots of interest in AI, uh, well beyond the data scientists. That's what I explained earlier. More resources are needed, more specialists are needed. Uh, and one of the things that's influencing what we're doing dramatically, which I said earlier already, you know, constant AI framework innovation. So it, getting getting uh, your compilers for your applications at the correct levels up um, and now has to be complemented by release after release after release after a release of frameworks, which are almost on a daily basis updated, changed. And so working that and, and developing applications with that uh, or algorithms with that is kind of problematic. So from a workflow perspective, this is typically on the top side of the screen, what happens in the initial phase of the, of the, of the development of AI algorithms. So until you get to the point where working a cluster on a cluster uh, is, is the optimal way of moving forward, which you see on the bottom side where the various users are sharing an infrastructure and queues on, the, on, on, on a scheduler on, uh, to use the resources available in the cluster to do the learning and to do the testing of the development of their, their AI algorithms. So where does our orchestration solution come in? So what we have been working on for the last three years is LICO, Lenovo Intelligence Cluster or Compute Orchestration, uh, which enables and which, which performs uh, as a kind of a transparency layer between the HPC world and the AI world. So how can we use LICO to optimally uh, do what we need to do? So, you know, one of the things that, that, that we do is, you know, we provide a GUI on top of uh, what uh, AI developers need to do. They use the GUIs, HPC specialists don't use a GUI, they use a command line with a five line a command without typos. That's not an issue for them. Translate that into a GUI uh, and you can help the developers. It's user friendly from an application perspective and it simplifies AI training uh, deployment after you have developed uh, the solutions. So, where does it stand for LICO, Lenovo Intelligent Computing Orchestration? What uh, does it do? It provides a zing single glass of pain uh, for both HPC and uh, uh, AI workloads based on open source, open HPC based. Lenovo value add. So um, capabilities that we ha have developed ourselves 
uh, AI capabilities are provided with the solution, which can be used as a template to further develop and to start from, from an AI development perspective. So from an AI framework perspective, the obvious ones are in there. It's just a summary of the frameworks that are in there. Then from a cluster management perspective, operating systems, it supports Red Hat and SUSE and the open source versions of these uh, friends. And the middle layer, so the green block and the orange block, is the block that has a lot of variation. So what we do within the Liga framework is we, up, we in integrate the different frameworks and the different open HPC uh, software stack components into it to facilitate one platform that can support both environments. And that can be based command line, that could be based GUI based. It is, uh, a, it's a, a, a transparency layer to facilitate a, a, a hybrid environment and hybrid operating environment for both AI development, machine learning development and HPC. So what I mentioned already, job templates for AI training are provided with, with the solution. So someone that wants to develop or needs to develop algorithms has something to, to, to start with already. And, and those building blocks uh, can be based on visual uh, image uh, recognition uh, uh, algorithms, for instance, that are being provided by us already, uh, which we have created based on the research that we've been doing with b both Barcelona Supercomputing and one of the US sites on um, CAT scan uh, uh, image recognition to do pattern recognition on, on cancer development in, in an early stage. And for Barcelona Supercomputing on glaucoma detection with, with the uh, with the, the eye hospital uh, connected to the uh, to Barcelona supercomputing uh, in order to not only uh, qualify uh, recognize the patterns and qualify the uh, the, the the image uh, uh, but also be able to prioritize the next action in the in the healthcare cycle so I mentioned the templates already uh, in here provided uh, object detection image classification and medical image segmentation is what has formed the base for uh, those uh, uh, capabilities that we have been developing uh, with Barcelona Supercomputing and with the US sites on, 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 on uh, pattern recognition on, on, on cancer development. Um, so from a, uh, an HPC perspective, uh, for HPC users, there is a graphical uh, uh, mode. So people that are starting with HPC can use a GUI to create a job, start a job, connect the data related to the job to it, and submit a job, but also monitor the job progress through the queue once it's dispatched and when the output gets back. But as you see on the right side of the screen, you can also still use the command prompt. So experienced users can still use uh, the same uh, way of operating as what they, what they did in the past, while new users uh, and AI and machine learning users can use the GUIs to they run that jobs and, and start that jobs. Um, so from a from an AI framework perspective, um, keeping up, I mentioned that's one of the one of the biggest problem areas already, uh, because of the, the the speed of change that's happening to the framework. So through this, through Docker uh, uh, Docker image downloading to local machines and then uploading into Lico, Lico as a singularity container, is the process that we uh, support to adopt changes to, to the new, uh, to the frameworks um, in a very rapid pace and transparent for application and users. So monitoring uh, in flight of Intel Cafe learning exercise or TensorFlow uh, uh, piece of development that, that has been done, which is being tested from a learning perspective. Everything can be done. So from a development of the AI algorithm to testing to the deployment and then pushing it into operation can be done through one pane of glass. Convergence, managing H HPC is the conclusion of this. HPC and AI convergence is easy or easier, a lot easier with, with LICO. Um, leverage, leverage is open HPC, complete open HPC stack, complemented with AI capabilities, um, a graphical user of interface supporting the easy uh, development of and testing of AI algorithms, and after that, final de the deployment. I hope that I have made it within the time. I had to speed up a little bit. If there's any questions, I would love to hear them, and I hope I can respond to them. Thank you very much, Rick. Uh, very interesting. So perhaps while we are waiting for 
for questions from the audience, I will ask a few questions or one or two. It's so a Lico. topic. It is a topic that can uh, can take you a, a, a day or two days, but yeah. uh, you can also uh, have to talk about it uh, for about 25 minutes. But it's, it's right. uh, I had Rick. to step up, but there's a lot of detail on it. Yeah. Rick, uh, Lico, is it standalone uh, Lenovo product or is it uh, sort of bundled with, with uh, Lenovo hardware only? No, it's a, it's a, it's an, an open, the product has been open sourced and yes. there is no licenses uh, related to it. The only thing what we do is it, there's two forms you can you can obtain the code. One code is without support, and the other version is with support. And and with the supported version, uh, there's a very low charge per processor uh, uh, only to to be able to to cover the support expenses that have have to be made on supporting uh, and anticipating changes that have to be made to anticipate customer change. So you mentioned uh, Barcelona Supercomputer Center. Yeah. Could you give us some more uh, reference sites for this product? Oh, I, I, you've seen one of the one of the pictures in in. Uh, I started with already is one of the other yeah, sites okay. that right. uses it. Um, we um, uh, there is a, uh, an, an, a the a Cynet in in Canada is using it. Um, and we are also now working with Harvard with the new uh, water cooled machine that's going to be one water cooled machine that's going to be deployed over there also uh, on this area. And we have a number of, of, of Asia Pacific okay. uh, sites where this is being used. Good. Rick, there's a question from the audience, from Bartosz actually, from uh, my colleague from ICM. Okay. Can you, can you read it? <clears throat> can you see it on your screen? <clears throat> Question, moderated questions. What's the roadmap for Lico? Are you planning to support PyTorch? The answer is yes. And uh, basically um, the roadmap is, is that uh, there is uh, two or three uh, re new releases every year. We just released a new version uh, of the product, which is also aimed uh, at, at the enterprise landscape, which uh, supports uh, Kubernetes. Um, uh, which is not something that is on uh, a very demanding requirement in the in, in the uh, academic landscape, but in the commercial landscape, uh, the enterprise landscape, it is uh, uh, on high demand. So that is the the, the release of last month uh, introduced Kubernetes as a uh, as as new capabilities to the product. So two or three releases each and every year. Right. Do we have uh, any other questions? I can't see any. So, Rick, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, most probably will be following with various uh, email uh, and emails, chats, and, and Perfect. discussions. Perfect. 